Welcome to this module of Professor Messer's free CompTIA Network Plus certification training course, the online training course that builds muscle mass. I'm James Messer, and in this module, we're going to talk about implementing a wireless network. If you're in an environment where you need to deploy wireless networks, this is a great module to look at because we're going to step from beginning to end at things you should consider when doing that. This comes from our N10-004 exam, section 3.4, where we need to implement a basic wireless network. We need to install clients. We need to put the access point somewhere. Where do we put it? We need to install the access point with encryption and what channels and frequencies we're using. Do we set ESSIDs? What are those beacon configurations going to be? And finally, how are we going to verify that our wireless network is now operating properly. So let's get started with the 802.11 networking overview. I thought it'd be useful before we talk about putting in a wireless network, what's really involved here? Do we need to really define a different configurations and what type of access point are we going to be using? Now these A, B, G, and N formats have different frequencies they use and they also have different throughputs and almost more importantly when we're beginning the installation process, how far can we expect these access points to transmit their signal? Now obviously there are things that will change based on where things are going, but this is a good place that you can start and you can at least have an idea of pluses, minuses, should we put an access point closer or farther, we can base it on what some of these approximate ranges are. Well, if we have workstations that need to connect to our wireless network, then we need to first install a wireless client there. So we're going to get a piece of hardware that's going to connect via USB. It's going to have an embedded wireless card inside of it. We need to get that hardware from somewhere. It may be something that comes in our laptop. It may be a card we install on a desktop. It could be a card bus adapter or a PCMCIA adapter, or it may be one of these great little USB key type adapters. And we need to also load software for this. Now, if you've ever worked with an instance installation from a third party manufacturer, you know there's a couple of ways to do this. One is a capability that's built into the operating system itself. Windows calls this the Windows Wireless Zero Configuration. And what it's designed to do is it doesn't, doesn't really care what manufacturer's wireless cards you're using. It uses its own configuration system to get you onto the wireless network. Now, some manufacturer's cards have capabilities that might go beyond the capabilities of the Windows Wireless Zero configuration, or maybe just prefer using that manufacturer's setup routine. You can use their specific drivers. So if you're in, installing an Intel card, a Linksys card, a D-Link card, a Netgear card, they are also all going to have their own manufacturer specific configuration and setup programs as well. Now you sometimes will even have a choice. You may like the Windows Wireless Zero config, use that one. Or you may want to take advantage of some additional capabilities on the manufacturer's configuration themselves, then use the manufacturer's card. Ultimately, as long as you connect to the wireless network, really doesn't matter whose driver you're using. These screens are from the Windows wireless configuration where we are setting up and configuring a wireless network based on the built-in capabilities of Windows. And if you look at the connection for this wireless network adapter, in fact, it has a check mark here that says, I'm going to use Windows to configure my wireless network settings. If you had the driver from the third party, just uncheck that and you can use Intel's setup utility or D-Link setup utility or Linksys's setup utility. And you can see here all of the networks that might be available to you. And here's the one of the networks that my uh, wireless adapter card happens to see talking out there on the network. What I'd like to do is maybe look at the properties of that network card and I get this screenshot here. So I can see that I know the SSID of this network and I have the option to say if I'm not broadcasting this SSID, go ahead and connect to it. We'll talk more about broadcasting that SSID beacon in just a bit. Now this network is probably configured with some type of encryption. So you need to first understand how you get access to the network or how you are authenticated onto the network. There are a lot of different parameters here, WPA, WPA2, for instance. There's also a separate key that you would configure for the encryption on this network. All of these things have to match what's configured on the access point. If you configure one of these incorrectly, you just won't have access to the wireless network or you won't have the ability to see traffic going over the wireless network. So sometimes you may have to go back to your access point, look at the config, ask the manufacturer, ask the administrator of that access point rather, how'd you configure this? What type of authentication and what type of key did you give it? And I'll configure it in my system identical so that I'm able to communicate on the wireless network. There's a few other connections we can work on. This is the encryption type for WPA, for instance. Notice that even the encryption type itself 
uses different technologies depending on which authentication type you're choosing to begin with. So make sure again that these all match up. And as long as they match up, you're fine. Sometimes you can play around with this, do uh, uh, different types of configurations, take a stab and guess at some of these things, and you may be lucky. There's not all of all that many configuration options here. And sometimes a hit or miss is all you can do if you don't have direct access to the access point. There's another way to look at access or authentication into the network. You can use 802.1x. We talked about IEEE standard 802.1x in our previous module where we talked about providing authentication access into the network using a third-party radius server, a TACAC server. You can also get authentication via a smart card, for instance. So there's different ways to allow you access onto the network that may have to prove that you have a card with you or prove that you know a username and password, which goes a little bit farther beyond just simply adding a network key into this that could be shared with someone else. So if our client workstations are ready to go, let's talk about where we're going to put this access point. So the placement of the access point becomes pretty important. We need to know where are the users or who's going to access this wireless network. Is it only going to be when you're in a, a desktop or is it going to be when you're in a conference room? So you need to understand where does the signal need to be the best and maybe some secondary areas where people might be using the wireless network. One thing you want to be careful about is avoiding anything in the way. These wireless signals are very short bandwidths, uh, very short frequencies rather, and if they get to a concrete wall or piece of metal, they will become attenuated. The signal strength will drop quite a bit. So stay away from the walls. Maybe make sure that if you have an access point that it's facing out towards where all the users are. Maybe you can even use some specialized antennas. There are a number of high gain antennas or omnidirectional or very directional antennas called Yagi antennas that you can use to point directly to another location. A lot of people use Use those if you're going between buildings, for instance, in the same area, you can set up a directional antenna. The antennas on both sides are pointed right at each other. And that way you're able to get a very good signal between those two. If you happen to be outside of that direct line of sight on that type of antenna, you don't have very much signal. It's really directing that signal right at the other side. And it, that might help. You may avoid having to put a fiber between the buildings, dig a trench, do a lot of physical type configurations just by adding an antenna and pointing it at the other building. Finally, you can think about using multiple access points. In very large environments, this is almost guaranteed that you would need multiple access points, even in your home. Uh, my house is very long. It's a one-story house, and it goes a long distances, and I have a lot of walls. So on one end of my house is my office. On the other end is my bedroom. And I can't find a good place in the middle that a wireless signal is really going to be good on both sides. So I have an access point in my office and another in the bedroom, and now I'm covering the entire house. And that really helps quite a bit with the signal. It works the same way if you're in a very large building. You need to overlap that signal. Notice that you can also use frequencies that won't overlap. Signal strengths, uh, signal frequencies 1, 6, and 11. If you're using multiple access points, you don't want the frequencies fighting with each other, so you put them all on different frequencies. We'll talk more about that in just a moment. Let's do some what if. Let's say we were going to put an access point into this person's office. Where would be some good places to put an access point? Well, we know our telecommunications room, our data room, this is where our networking equipment is. And if I was to put an access point right here, I may not be able to get a signal all the way back over to these corner offices. That might be a problem. One central place you can see is this presentation room. I bet this is used often as a conference room. It would be great to put an access point maybe right outside that room in an omnidirectional antenna, and I could probably hit a big chunk of this area. All optionally, I may want to put access points at different corners of the office where the antenna signal is facing to the inside and cover most of the building that way. But if I can get it done with one access point, that might save me a little money, a little time, and, and be a little simpler. Sometimes it isn't quite so simple, though. Here's a very large apartment building. And you can see part of the complications with this is that you've got pieces of the apartment building that go off on the corners. And in the middle, there's nothing. There must be a courtyard or something for this apartment building. So where am I going to put an access point? In this environment, a single access point probably isn't going to work very well. So what I may end up doing, since I have these uh, these areas near the lobbies of the building. Maybe I put an access point in this lobby and in this lobby, and I still have access through these stairwells, through the elevator shafts to be able to run wires and equipment, but still be able maybe to cover with an omnidirectional antenna, cover a large circle here, and maybe overlap a little bit right in the middle. Maybe that's the way I do it. It just takes a little bit 
bit of figuring out from the floor plan and then examining what's in the way and the antennas I'm going to be able to use. So you can see why this is a very specialized process. Very, very often companies are bringing in third parties that do this all the time that have been through the ups and the downs of installing wireless because sometimes it does get to be a little bit complicated. When we were configuring our wireless clients, one of the things that you noticed is that the wireless encryption used WPA for its encryption type. You don't want to use an encryption type called WEP, W-E-P. There were some cryptographic vulnerabilities in WEP that were identified back in 2001. And it's extremely simple to hack into a WEP encrypted network. It only takes a few minutes. I've got your WEP key. And from that point on, I can see everything going on over that network. You instead want to use something called Wi-Fi Protected Access, WPA. And there are different flavors of it, different forms. It's called a little bit different depending on where you go. It's WPA, WPA2 or WPA2 Enterprise. You want to use at least one of those three whenever you're configuring your access point. Use WPA2 Enterprise. If you don't have that, use WPA2. If you don't have that, use WPA. And that will be sure that you're using an encryption type that there are no known vulnerabilities with. People are not going to be able to simply hack into your network in a few minutes using that type of encryption. This uses some pre-shared keys. You can give people a 8 to 63 printable ASCII character key or provide them with a 256-bit key or passphrase. So a couple of different ways to give people access to the network in ways that human beings can find easy to do and also ways that make sense when you're configuring access points directly. I mentioned when we were putting multiple access points on the network that it would be nice if we could configure this and not have to overlap a lot of different frequencies. And this really goes back to the standard of 802.11. When IEEE was putting this standard together, they put a lot of different ones in place over the years. There's an 802.11a, b, g, n, but the frequencies that they use is very common throughout all of them. This is a great diagram that's on Wikipedia. And what it shows is the frequency distribution for each one of these wireless channels. And this is an example for the ones that are in the United States and even further out with all 14 channels available. Notice that channel one, channel six, and channel 11 do not overlap with each other with their frequencies. Now that means if I wanted to put two access points in an environment, that would be a good way to do it. Now alternatively, I could use channel three and channel nine. You can see those two channels don't, don't get in anybody's way either. The problem comes if I'd like to add a third, there's nowhere else to go. It's gonna conflict somewhere because in the United States, we can only use channels one through channel 11. Outside of the US, there are just different options available. So usually people stick to 1, 6, and 11. And as long as you are covered there, you can almost always avoid someone else who's there or make sure that you can add on later into a frequency that's available. One of the configuration options we looked at originally in our wireless client was the ability to turn on the connection to a network even if we didn't see a beacon from it. It's SSID beacon. This stands for Extended Service Set Identification. And you'll see it called ESSID. You also see it abbreviated as SSID. It's exactly the same thing. What this access point does by default is it sends out a broadcast all the time to everybody who might be out there saying, hi, I'm here just to let you know I'm an access point and you can connect to me. Now, if you want to disable that, you have to go into the access point and say, don't tell anybody you're here. Don't broadcast that out for the world to see. So usually you'll change that default setting so that nobody else can see that access point sending out a broadcast. One thing to keep in mind though, this is not security. This does not prevent someone from accessing the access point. It simply makes it a little bit quieter so that people don't actually know the access point is there. You can still get SSID information directly from the packet. So if somebody's sitting out there and sniffing the air, they're watching the packets go through, they can still see SSID information. You're not really fooling anybody there. You'll see this in your access point. This is from my access point under my advanced wireless settings. There's an option here to first enable the access point, and here's the option to enable or disable the SSID broadcast. So it's that simple. I uncheck that, and now my broadcast disappears completely. And as long as your clients out there on your network can use an access point without hearing the broadcast, you're fine. Not all machines, unfortunately, work exactly the same way. You may not have a choice. You may have to broadcast the SSID. Just make sure you understand that you will also need authentication and encryption to go along with that to be sure that that access point is protected.
your wireless network is up, you're running, you've got people using the network, but is it really getting to the, all the far distances of that building? Are there other devices that are along the same area of this building that are creating conflicts? Is the microwave oven creating too much interference for your wireless network? Well, one good way to tell is to look at something like this, a spectrum analyzer, which will look at the signals that it sees out there on the network and be able to tell you, is there any noise? Is there a problem with it? If we move to the far end of the building, can we still see the signal and how much of it can we say? So we may be able to do a little bit of tweaking with antennas, change some of the strengths that we're sending out of our access point to make sure that every place in the building that we need to get that wireless signal can see it properly. We've now put together our wireless network. We've configured clients. We've done a lot with getting things up and running. Let's see if we can remember what we've learned. Our first question is, what encryption should be used for all 802.11 wireless networks? It's the first question here for a reason. It's really important. And it is WPA or WPA2. As long as it has those letters WPA inside of it, you'll be in good shape. The next question, which three wireless channels can be used without overlap here in the United States? They could probably be used without overlap elsewhere as well, but you get the idea. It is channels 1, 6, and 11. Those are the big three when you're in the U.S. for configuring access point channels. And what feature can be disabled to hide the name of an access point so that it is hidden if somebody just goes out looking for an access point? And the answer is to hide the ESSID beacons, the Extended Service Set Identification Beacons. Well, now we've covered soup to nuts, putting an access point in, configuring some clients, making sure afterwards that we've verified the installation. We've seen it all in this module. If you'd like to go and look at other Network Plus videos that we have, if you'd like to participate in our message board, send me a message and much more, you can visit our website, freenetworkplus.com.